it's nice to know I'm in demand and not one of ten most wanted as a uh, <laughs> character to speak. The uh, topic that I chose to talk about is matched in uh, some senses to the expertise here at George Washington. You have excellence in cybersecurity and in policy, law, government, uh, and those are some areas that are involved in this. Uh, first of all, let me assure you, I am in fact a computer science faculty member. Uh, some of you are wondering that because I'm not projecting slides on the screen <laughs> as I talk, uh, and uh, that's on purpose. The, uh, the problem with cybersecurity is not a technology problem per se. And uh, I learned that a few days ago, uh, Wes Bush, the CEO of Northrop Grumman, was, was here and said something to that effect. Uh, we have technology problems. We have issues that we need to address. But the problem space is much larger than the technology. Uh, my friend and frequent collaborator, Simpson Garfinkel, uh, said that this is a classic example of what he calls a wicked hard problem. And it is a wicked hard problem because it is not something that exists in a single domain of expertise, at least as we currently define it. And as we solve some issues, new ones crop up to take their place fairly quickly. So what I'm going to do tonight is touch on a few areas that compose part of the problem that may also present some opportunities for a solution, but explain why this is such a hard problem, why the uh, cybersecurity problem is so large. And uh, one of the first aspects of this is to talk about, well, what do I mean by it's a problem? And there are several measures, certainly, that we could apply to this, many of which you have seen in newspapers and magazines, television, perhaps experienced yourself. And by this I really mean as uh, end users, we are victims of considerable amounts of cyber crime and as a nation, cyber espionage. Now the talk I could give could actually be a global talk. Uh, pretty much every country is victimized by cyber crime and by certain amounts of cyber espionage. I'm really going to focus on a US-centric view for purposes of this talk. Of those two, crime is one of the ones that's most visible to you, uh, perhaps personally or at least in the news media. Uh, some of the crime is very well organized. It has been an operation for some time. If you talk to people in the law enforcement community, there is sufficient evidence for them to point to individuals who are involved and working in an organized fashion in Eastern Europe, in Asia. Uh, some by, go by uh, well-established names. The Russian Business Network is one organization that's been around for a while. Uh, these are groups that actually often work nine to five by, by looking at the times of activities online. We can determine that they are working regular hours. Uh, they post pictures of the fancy cars they have and the uh, expensive homes. And they're involved regularly in various kinds of crime involving uh, selling fake pharmaceuticals, uh, but more often uh, phishing, stealing identity information, stealing credit card information. The amount in credit card fraud in the US is likely in the hundreds of millions of dollars annually. Uh, we don't see those figures published, but we all end up paying that because the credit card companies charge that back to the merchants, charge that back to us. The malware aspects, computer viruses, worms, phishing kinds of activities uh, are a growing and continuing problem. If we look at the numbers right now of the kinds of malware that are circulated for your PCs, for your laptops, your general computers, uh, the number, according to McAfee, uh, one of the major antivirus firms, they are registering currently 50 new instances per minute worldwide. Uh, now that's up from five years ago when it was only 10 per minute. One of the things I'd ask you, of course, is if you're running antivirus software, and I would hope you are, how often do you update it? 50 new instances per minute? You may not be keeping up. Uh, there are some issues involved. Uh, 
with that kind of protection. Cell phones. Now that cell phones have become more general purpose computers, uh, we're seeing on the order of uh, two or three new per hour, there are over 2,500 known computer viruses uh, for cell phones, the majority of those Android cell phones. So those of you who are using Windows and Android uh, together, you know, you're really out of luck. <laughs> But that number is increasing on a regular basis, and that's being used to steal passwords, steal address book information, uh, and if you do any kind of online credit or online banking, that, that information is being stolen as well. Total number of uh, instances of malware that are registered with uh, the McAfee company right now exceeds 60 million instances that they know of that they look for. There are a number that they've retired from that collection. Uh, that's an incredible load of viruses and other kinds of problems. And this is a phenomenon that first emerged in 1985 with two instances. I remember going to conferences in 1992-93 uh, where there were three, 400 viruses and we thought the problem was uh, going to uh, be unstoppable and by the time we hit 500 we wouldn't be able to use our computers anymore. Uh, password theft Trojan programs. These are things that you run uh, or, or websites that you go to to steal your password. And there are two, two million new ones per year being registered that are found. If we look at numbers for last year, and just a few more to give you a sense of the magnitude, uh, breaches of commercial database systems, either medical systems, credit bureaus, others. Uh, there were 475 reported data breaches in the United States with over 30 million personal records disclosed. Uh, why that makes a difference is because that is now information that can be used to steal your identity or be used to fool you into visiting one of these uh, theft sites. Um, one of the interesting figures has to do with phishing and uh, search engine manipulation. It turns out that breaking news stories, the, these criminal groups that are involved, immediately go out and register websites and domains that match the news story. So for instance, today's earthquake uh, in two earthquakes in Indonesia uh, that were very significant, there are now a number of websites that have already been created that look very professional for fundraising for charities for victims of the earthquake. If you were to go to a website and look for trending news terms, so anything that is currently in the top of the news, 50% of the sites that you would visit as a result of going through a search engine uh, would contain some kind of Trojan software that would try to implant itself onto your, uh, onto your computer. And if you just pick any term at random, a little over 1% of all the sites you visit would attempt to plant malware on your computer. That's the background that we're operating in. Another kind of computer crime that's going on in the background that we don't see as much of is espionage. Uh, this is where corporate or political entities are breaking into commercial systems to steal the intellectual property. And this has tremendous value in the uh, private space for companies in other countries that want to uh, get the research without actually doing the investment or for foreign governments that are interested in moving ahead and leapfrogging their technology at our expense. And where this hurts is that we have companies that spend hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, particularly in heavily regulated industries such as pharmaceuticals, aerospace, uh, and, and others, to do research to prove what they're doing works, to look for new technologies, in some cases to handle licensing for, for instance, in pharmaceuticals, only to have that information stolen online by individuals who then transfer that information to companies in other countries, possibly government-affiliated companies. Uh, there have been instances of testimony before Congress within the last month that indicated at least one instance of a company losing a $1 billion value uh, project that took over 10 years to create uh, was downloaded to a site in China in a matter of, of a matter of hours, and so 10 years worth of effort gone. 
And where this hurts is that the companies that receive this stolen information are then able to turn around without the investment in the research or the research infrastructure and offer competing products on the market that will undercut the legitimate products that are being sold by these organizations and effectively uh, uh, outcompete them because they do not have the overhead of the cost. Mike McConnell, the former director of national intelligence, um, said that the uh, IP theft currently is in the billions of dollars per year. <laughs> it is unreported and in some cases unrecognized until uh, companies involved discover that they have a, something competing with them from another country and label it as the biggest transfer of wealth in history. That's a rather, a rather major statement, uh, that the biggest transfer of wealth in history and largely going, as he said, west of here. Our laws and structures aren't well suited to respond because even if we detect this uh, and it is a violation of law, uh, we don't know who to identify. We don't have names in particular. All we have are instances of uh, network addresses on machines in other countries. And we can complain to those other countries. Uh, and uh, the response we often get is, uh, somebody is framing us. We don't allow that kind of thing to occur from where we are. So uh, there doesn't appear to be anything in place to stop that. That's part of this overall problem of why the, the security problem is important, but also difficult to solve because it does involve an international component, and we have so few remedies in place. What we need to do then is we need to have better protection in place to prevent this kind of activity from occurring. And this is where so many of the difficulties uh, come into play. Uh, I'll note that, related to some comments I'll make in a moment, the security industry for software in the United States was $8 billion last year. Some estimates are that we lost 10 to $20 billion worth of uh, goods and services. Uh, $8 billion more being spent on security software and services, and that's expected to increase by 50% over the next four years. Okay, so why do we have this kind of problem? Why are our systems giving up this information, and why does it seem uh, that we have these vulnerabilities? Well, the answer is, like many other difficult problems, it's a combination of things. Part of it has to do with the growth of the field and the nature of how the field has transformed very quickly from a scientific enterprise into a major commercial one. It also has to do with the cost and resistance to change, some expectations that have been created, and I'll talk more about some of the regulatory issues in a moment. So part of the issue of change is something that Few people take, uh, really few people understand, mostly take for granted. And I know several of the students in the audience uh, aren't old enough to remember this, uh, but at one point, computers were the size of small buildings, involved lots of vacuum tubes, and were very, very expensive to run. Uh, we, we have at least a few people here who remember that. Uh, 1958 was a major year uh, for IBM because that was the year they offered the first all-transistor computer. And that may seem like a long time ago to some of you, uh, but it was a major gamble for IBM to go with all transistors because it was a new technology. And what's more, it was a very expensive technology because if we were to translate the cost of transistors, not integrated circuits, but the raw transistors themselves, uh, to current dollars, they were $60 a piece for a transistor. And you needed a lot of them for a computer system. So the computers that IBM was selling in 1958, the first ones that went out with the transistors, uh, would cost the equivalent of $23 million. So those of you who have got a laptop, either on your lap or at your feet, uh, not even talking about the difference in processing power, but think about that change in cost, about how much that has come down. Part of that, seven order of magnitude drop in price is uh, related to just simply the production of transistors for lots of things. We found ways to mass produce these on integrated circuits to the point that we are now manufacturing uh, on the order of um, 12 quintillion 
transistors per year. In, in 2008, uh, the number of transistors manufactured each year crossed the number of grains of rice produced every year. But we make more transistors every year worldwide than all grains of rice that are grown and harvested. And, uh, 10 quintillion is the, is the estimate of the number of grains of rice. That's uh, one followed by 19 zeros. And for those of you who are wondering how we know that, it's Brad's students. <laughs> I gotta do something for those RAs. Um, it's not simply processing, but storage. And this is another aspect that has just had an amazing impact on what we have done with information, how we're doing things with computing. In 1958, that computer system that was produced uh, had about 2,000 bits of binary information, 0, 1 bits that would store information. Um, and it cost, in current dollars, about 10 cents per byte, where a byte is 8 bits together. 10 cents per byte in 1958. So right now, if you go out and you look and you price uh, some of that uh, memory, you'll find 500 gigabits per cubic inch at about 18 cents per gigabyte. Now that's, another, that's a drop of eight orders of magnitude in cost for storage. Again, huge, huge change in what we can do. We have transformed the way we do most things from recording information about what happened to using that information to decide what happens. And to make better decisions more quickly, we're now storing more information than ever before and depending upon the output of that calculation. So that goes to the total storage. The internet of 10 years ago would fit on about 50 commodity PCs, if we were to have them in this room. Uh, that's about a, in the hundreds of terabytes of information. So today's technology, we could go out to a Fry's, a Best Buy, uh, Sears, and buy computers with regular attached storage, 50 of them in this room, the entire internet of 10 years ago. The entire internet of 20 years ago would fit on a single computer. Well, it's not so special about this year because that's been true now for about six years. Every year, going back 10 and 20 years, the technology would allow you to store what was there. One of the implications of that that I'd like some of you to think about is 10 years from now or 20 years from now, imagine the internet of today fitting on one thing that you have 20 years from now. What would you do with all that information? Not that you can get through all the YouTube videos in that time, but, <laughs> but if you just think about what that would do for you. Um, So the combination of processing and storage have just had this incredible impact on what we do with computing. And we haven't thought about that very quick change. So instead of going back that 50 years, let me just say that if you went back to 1985, the most powerful computer system in the world uh, was a Cray XMT computer. And it cost in the millions of dollars. It was developed by the government. It required super cooling. It was it was just an incredibly complex um, machine. This is an iPhone 4. Two of these combined have more processing power and storage than the world's fastest computer 25 years ago. 25 years from now, what will you be carrying? Where will we be with the technology? That's the pace of change that has had such an impact on what we do with computing. And it is part of the reason we have the, the security problems we do. Secure uh, network speed as well. In the, in the 90s, uh, we had roughly a kilobit per second in speed. Now we're up in the gigabit uh, per second speed. We're up to over 2 billion users worldwide on the network. And if you think that we are conducting in the, uh, I, don't, I don't have the up-to-date figure, but think about all the commerce on the internet at large, all the advertising, all of the uh, things that are streamed across it. 20 years ago, nothing. 20 years ago was the development of the World Wide Web and the first commercial use of the network. So 
most of these security problems have really manifested themselves in the last 20 years, not even in the last 50. This is one of the roots of the problem with cybersecurity. Not the fact that we have fast computers, not the, fast that we, uh, the fact that we are storing so much, not that uh, we have the commercial use of the network. It's the pace of change. We have moved so quickly that once something gains acceptance in the market, it's next to impossible to replace it. So if you have a computer system for your work, that you have storage and programs and uh, applications that you have developed for your job, you will add more to it and eventually you will find that the system is getting slower or the disk is filling up. So what do you do? You go out and you buy a new one. You buy a new computer, you buy new storage. But you have such an amount of investment in what you've got on your desktop or on your laptop or wherever you're storing it that you get something that is compatible, that everything can just be moved over because you don't want to buy new programs. You don't want to translate all the information. You just move it over. Then, because you now have all this new capacity, you go out and buy new software to add to that collection. And the companies that made the software are working to develop new versions with new features because they need to continue to sell into the marketplace to continue to make a profit. So you get upgrades to the software. You don't replace it generally. As a result, we see this steady accumulation, this steady upgrade of the same software, the same hardware that are old and built on principles that are old principles, built at a time when security was not a concern. And yet, we still are depending on it now for high security applications. A classic example is the Windows operating system. Windows was designed in 1989. We've learned a lot about security since 1989, but you won't find it built in to a Windows system. It is because of the cost and the compatibility issues we continue to use these older platforms. It's kind of frightening to me that that same platform that was originally developed for the home user to do a little programming, keep recipes and play games, is also being used to keep our medical records, national defense, is being used for command and control of our nuclear weapon systems. And if you read the disclaimer, it says it's not to be used for anything important. <laughs> um, so that's certainly a part of the problem. Uh, another aspect is that hasn't kept up is our educational system about how to use this technology. Uh, you've certainly seen, if you follow some of the policy discussions, some of the issues involved with STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, but more particularly when we start looking at what happens with computing, this technology change has had a very adverse effect on the educational system. Most of our young people, in, uh, particularly in uh, urban school districts, don't have access to computers. And if they do, the computer courses that they have are keyboarding. They're not computer science. They're not programming. They're not learning anything about security. They're learning how to type. That's not really preparing them for the future. Uh, and it's not preparing them for the present, for that matter. Uh, but that's the environment we have. And we're also in a political climate where talking about any increase in expenditure, particularly for K-12 systems, seems to generate a political backlash. Uh, but that is contributing to the problem. We don't have the expertise starting out. In fact, in most states in the United States, uh, computer science is not considered a science. You cannot take it to satisfy a science requirement. You can take it to satisfy a vocational technology requirement, which I find somewhat troublesome as somebody working in computer science. Uh, we also have a problem that there are fewer students in general who are signing up for computer science as a science. Uh, in part, that may be because over the years, we've had this uh, view that we're offshoring a lot of our computing jobs, and nothing could be farther from the truth. If you have any uh, young people that you, uh, you know who are interested in career choices, the best projections from the Bureau of Labor Statistics indicate that by the time they would complete a college degree four or five years from now, 
there are likely to be six or eight positions for every graduate in the United States. And they're good jobs. So uh, this is part of the problem is the enrollment is down. And there are a number of reasons for that. Part of that is that uh, our school system has not prepared our students for the rigors of uh, STEM kinds of degrees in general. Uh, they're taught to dislike mathematics. It is, it is a chore. It's not something that is worth studying. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, it's also a case that the value, once they get out, for many of our undergraduate students, uh, they can get a 50% higher starting salary going uh, into business school. Uh, some, I, I'm told that, in, in fact, some, uh, we, we graduate more physical therapists every year than we do computer scientists. Uh, there, there's something wrong in that equation. And, and uh, part of that has to do with pay, benefits, and the perception of how hard the field is. So the combination of the speed and change in the field and the inability of our education system to help keep up, at least at a lower level, are a big part of the problem. We've also had some market failures. And part of the market failure is that uh, uh, we're really interested in buying poor stuff. That's, that's the title I have. We buy poor stuff. That's not grammatically correct. But uh, we are distracted by bright, shiny, new toys. Uh, oh, it's slimmer. Oh, it's faster. Oh, it's got a number after it. Uh, so we'll buy it. Um, think about some of the phones. People standing in line to buy the latest edition of a new cell phone with a new operating system. It really doesn't do anything beyond the old one, except maybe download viruses faster. <laughs> My uh, colleague, Ed Felton, uh, said many years ago, I think it captured this, uh, given a choice between security and dancing bears, users will choose dancing bears every time. <laughs> so part of what drives this is a very strong marketing machine, because the companies obviously want to make money from what they market. And I'm not going to pick on anyone in particular. Well, maybe I will. but. Um, <laughs> What happens in the marketplace now, and has been happening for many years, is companies are rewarded for being first to market, not best to market. So for many things, if you are the first one with a concept and can gain the market share before anybody else gets in to compete, you have a dominant and economically important position. And so companies strive to get things out the door as quickly as possible to generate revenue. And if you look at what some of the venture capital funds will do, they will push companies to skip testing, to skip some of the design analysis, simply to be out of the market quickly so that they can gain uh, recovery on their investment. Companies have found that it's more profitable to patch products than get it right the first time. And that is despite studies that show, at least in the development process, it's a factor of 15 difference between getting the design right and doing a patch after the fact. The issue is most companies don't bother to patch. Uh, they will patch security critical items, but unless users complain in quantity and loudly, they won't patch a lot of the other flaws. And we have been uh, conditioned to accept those flaws. When we find things that don't work, we may report it if we can find a place to report it anymore. There's no longer a phone number. There, there may be a website we possibly could find if we looked. Uh, but there's no guarantee that anybody at the other end actually reads the email. Uh, so instead, we find workarounds. And we build those workarounds into what we do, which further exacerbates the problem because now we're used to that workaround. And so we have to have compatibility for the flaws in future updates. Otherwise, things break in unusual ways. Testing is expensive, and so companies do not invest in testing. Uh, and then, as customers, because what we're using is not standardized in a way that's portable for other vendors to supply uh, the replacements that we might use, we're stuck. We're stuck in using what we have, or we face a very large learning curve and a very large expense to go to something else. Vendors have worked to change the optics on this situation so that we accept it a little bit more easily. Um, 
and condition us further. And if you don't believe that we've been conditioned, for some of you who go back just a few years, ask yourself, how many years of your life have you wasted sitting watching a blue screen while you wait for a computer to reboot? If you've done it more than once, that's part of the conditioning. I'm not going to claim that blue has any particular psychological effect, uh, but it is, it is an aspect in this, this optics. Um, the vendors now clump the patches together once a month, so it looks like you're only getting one patch per month instead of the 20 or 30 or, in some cases, for some vendors, 75 that are otherwise coming out. That's a change in, in what you're seeing. Uh, they've also gotten to the point now, as part of the standard uh, discussion, when you go to buy the software, you're also offered antivirus, firewalls, maybe intrusion detection, depending on the size of your enterprise, as if you should buy all those things together. It's like choosing from dairy and grain and vegetables for a balanced meal, well, you've got to buy the antivirus and the firewall and the intrusion detection to go with your system, where the question really should be, well, why do I need to buy all those things to make the system usable? When you buy a car, do you have to go somewhere else to get the brakes? Um, there's something wrong with this picture, and yet we accept it very blindly, and that's part of the problem. We don't complain about it. We don't push back on it. We are being sold faulty products, and then we are expected to spend more money on other things to be able to fix it. Part of the optics change has been also encouraged by some of the community itself. We now have this mistaken view that penetration testing is somehow security. Right? So if we can break it, then that means that we're going to fix it. Um, instead of asking the question, well, if we can break it, isn't something wrong with it in the first place? Uh, it'd be like buying a car and, well, we'll go out and see just how many ways we can dent it. And then we'll pull the dent out and do it again. And that's how we determine that the car is safe. But we're doing that with software on a regular basis, penetration testing. In fact, now we have organizations, they're staging competition for our high school kids and college undergraduates that are hacking competitions. Who can hack into a system faster? Who can penetrate a system faster? As if this is somehow a measure of their skill to build anything reasonable. From the standpoint of security, it's easy to break things. I would not judge the quality of an automotive engineer by his or her ability to pour sugar in the gas tank. <laughs> but that's kind of where we are. Um, there's a lot of money involved in this paradigm, however. The security Anaheim business generates billions of dollars. I mentioned $8 billion uh, this year. It brings a lot of repeat business because you have to sign up for the updates. You have to subscribe to those regular updates. Otherwise, you're not protected against the next set of penetrations. And it also generates a huge market for offensive warfare tools. And uh, again, there are, that's billions of dollars, uh, most likely, although the exact numbers are classified and spread out over uh, various areas. If our national opponents or, or uh, other nations of interest are running the same broken tools and software we are, well then obviously there's lots of opportunity for us to build tools to break into their systems. And there's also a natural resistance to try to fix the security because, by gosh, they'll get it too. Uh, not quite getting the picture that as we lose all of this intellectual property, we have more to lose than many of those opponents. Companies have gotten into the mode of treating security as an expense rather than as a business enabler. Security and security is uh, uh, protocols are things that get in the way of business. They're kind of grudgingly added instead of being viewed as something that really can make a difference. And that's partly our fault in the community. Uh, security is not really something that should tell people not to do things. It should be to tell them how to do it more safely. Uh, an example that I've heard given, and I don't know the original source, said that uh, good security is like good brakes. Uh, it isn't to stop you. It's to allow you to go faster safely. And 
that's how we should be approaching security. Unfortunately, we have too many people who view it as saying no instead of saying, well, you do it this way. Um, the research enterprise is affected by this and is somewhat badly skewed and broken. Uh, we have a lot of research money that's going into building both weapons and patches rather than building secure systems from the start. I would say that uh, very little fundamental research is actually being done. And by research, I mean research in, in basic science to enable what we're doing. A lot of what we're doing is simply to patch the enterprise that's out there already. So for example, my talk is about security. I cannot define to you with precision what information security is. If I could, I could also tell you some metrics by which it could be measured and that you could use if you went out to buy a new computer system. We commonly use some terms like integrity and confidentiality. Well, I can't tell you what three units of integrity is. I can't tell you how to compare two items and definitively say how much better one is than another at keeping the integrity of your system intact or improving the confidentiality. And no one can. That would seem to be a very basic element of the field. And yet, there's no research effort really being conducted in that. Um, I chaired a uh, Grand Challenges workshop that was funded through the National Science Foundation. And the, the program officer who, who funded that is, is here in the audience. Um, and this was identified as one of the grand challenges. And I haven't really seen much progress on it. There are a few sub areas that was mentioned in discussion with the faculty today, such as in cryptography, where we do have some measures. But in general, it's really lacking. Um, I have submitted proposals in recent memory to some federal funding agencies for really different approaches to security, gotten back reviews that were very positive with annotations from people saying, this is really interesting. Uh, but don't fund this because it won't run Windows. <laughs> you know, that's sort of the idea uh, behind the science. We also have some problems here in the academic enterprise where a lot of the research is done. Uh, we have seen a shift in our focus from scholarship to producing income. Uh, so uh, the faculty are are pushed harder and harder to get more grants, to patent information, to do spin-off companies. Uh, our peers have started to judge us more on the number of publications rather than the quality of thought that goes into them. And so this pushes the enterprise more towards producing lots of small incremental results and papers. There's been a proliferation of journals and conferences that are really um, worthless. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll say that, that outright. The material is very suspect. But it gives people publication credits that they can use to count uh, and, and thereby try to gain favor in the promotion and tenure system. Even our graduate students getting out, who may have one really good idea that they develop into a dissertation, unless they are somehow able to manufacture five or six journal and conference papers from that, won't even be considered by a reasonable quality school. So they have to stretch those, those ideas in lots of different ways uh, to make that, that hold. In industry, we've had this focus on the near-term profit rather than the long-term sustainment. And so there are very few research labs anymore. We used to have uh, Bell Labs, Xerox Park, uh, other research enterprises that took the long view and thought of some major developments. They've largely disappeared because they can't be justified in the cost model. So our whole research enterprise has gotten skewed. And because of the pressure of the need for patches on this huge infrastructure we have, most of the effort has been gone, going into, can we find a new way to patch against the latest threat, fix the latest problem? And can we make money from it in the process? 20 years ago, when I would go to the major conferences, most of the vendors there were had products on producing secure software, on secure testing. And then after a while, I started to see all these booths pop up with antivirus, because the software wasn't secure against viruses. And then a few years later, it was firewalls. And why do we have the firewalls? Well, because the people using the computers didn't know how to configure them, and the security from the network wasn't good enough, and the viruses were getting in. And then after a while, another few years went by, and we started seeing intrusion detection products taking the market and being represented a lot in the booths. And by now, the secure software vendors had disappeared. 
And so we had intrusion detection because things were getting through the firewall and the antivirus and we had to detect them. <laughs> and then a couple of years later, we started having uh, encryption and extrusion prevention is what it was called. So extrusion prevention is interesting. Your firewalls failed, your host securities failed, your antivirus and intrusion detection have failed. Now we're going to detect as the information's leaving your system. <laughs> this year at the RSA conference, which is one of the major conferences, uh, I saw several vendors who had set up, and they are now marketing products that will snapshot your system on a regular basis so that after it's been broken into and modified, you can restore it more quickly. I don't know there's much farther away we can get from having a secure system. Uh, another element here in the education enterprise has to do with focus. Uh, the, uh, the Talby survey by the Computing Research Association is uh, the major survey of the field. And the uh, latest one that's been published in the open is the 2009-2010. And it indicates that in the US and Canada, only 51 PhDs graduated indicating a focus in information security. And I'll, I'll mention 15 of those were from my group at Purdue. So we, we had uh, uh, about uh, one third of the PhDs, but only 51 total. Well, that may seem like a lot, but it isn't when we're trying to staff up research and universities. And particularly when you consider that about half of those individuals are not US citizens, and are asked to leave the country within nine months after they get their degree. Where are they going? They're going back to those other countries and establishing businesses to compete with ours here in the US and possibly to staff government agencies that are used to attack some of our systems. Uh, there's something wrong with that, that we educate them, we, we provide them with the projects, and then we show them to the door. Um, faculty starting off in in uh, information security, uh, make about 75% of equivalent faculty getting jobs in business schools. Again, seems like the wrong incentives. And, and that, that wasn't necessarily a hint to the dean here. Uh, <laughs> although if you want to take it as such, I'm sure there are people here who would welcome it. <laughs> um, let me mention a few problems we have in the response to some of these problems. So nationally, as, as a kind of an approach we take as a nation, um, we tend to make minimal investment in things until they become a crisis. We just wait until it gets too big to ignore, and then we get all excited about it and do something. Um, that isn't a particularly good approach. It tends to cost more, but it is equivalent to what we're doing with security. It's, instead of doing it right the first time, we're patching it as the problems occur. Uh, all I have. If, if you don't doubt that, just look at what's going on with the budget and deficit issue. Um, but what we often do with some of these problems is we have to wait until we can portray it as an existential problem for the country. And then we take an all-out approach, often with the military. Uh, so we end up patching it rather than going to the uh, original causes. A lot of examples here, uh, what we do to respond to terrorism, for instance, but we have to have a war on drugs, so we have to have a war on poverty, and uh, a war on education, perhaps, is, is uh, what's involved. Um, part of this is, over time, because we build up the military, um, we tend to focus on that as a response and not law enforcement. And so when I mentioned a lot of these problems that we were having with intellectual property theft, credit card theft, fraud, those are law enforcement problems. Those are not military problems. Those are not being committed by nation states. Those are being committed by individuals and small groups. We need a law enforcement response to that, but we don't have one because the investment has gone into the military. Uh, they're not well prepared. If you think back six months to a year ago, the uh, various kinds of attacks that were being done by the group Anonymous or LulzSec, and they were breaking in and, and taking down machines and exposing information, those are groups non-national groups, individuals all over the network, some who didn't even know each other, we can't send in a SEAL team because there's no place to send them. These are not military issues, but we fail to invest in law enforcement to appropriately address these. We tend not to react to the slow, steady criminal element. 
or the low-level losses. We only react to the really big impulses. As an example, 9-11-2001 was a national tragedy. Uh, we lost uh, 2,993 individuals to uh, connected acts of terrorism. And you know the national response. We ended up invading two countries. Uh, millions of people were displaced. Billions have been spent. Uh, we've hurt our economy in many ways. It's, it's, really, it's really been quite an amazing ripple through effect. In 2001, 400,000 people died from smoking. When do we invade Kentucky and North Carolina? <laughs> Every year. Nearly half a million people die from cigarette and tobacco use. And yet, where's the response? 600,000 will die from heart disease. When do we send the SEAL teams into McDonald's? Rather than takeout. <laughs> in 2001, 20,000 people died in car crashes because they didn't wear seat belts. That's seven times the number who died in the World Trade incident and the Pentagon. You can pick pretty much any catastrophic event that, is, er, that has caused national attention and national movement and find similar kinds of numbers and background. As a nation, we are willing to tolerate a slow, steady loss. We are the proverbial, uh, proverbial frog being boiled alive, the Mark Twain story, that if you put a frog in a pot of hot water and slowly turn up the heat, Rather than jump out, it'll die. That's effectively what's happening in the cyber arena. And that's the way that our national response has been going. If you look at our R&D expenditures, uh, the amount being spent on research for law enforcement is less than 1% of what's being spent on new military technology. It's no wonder that they're not able to respond. I, I would love to be able to call in the Marines to help when my credit card number is stolen, uh, but it's not going to happen because that isn't their job, that isn't their training. So let's talk a little bit about, the, or let me talk a little bit about the political arena. Um, what's going on there? Well, if we look at what Congress is doing, um, we have a lot of people who are attempting to regulate the series of tubes, and they don't really understand what's going on. In fact, they uh, have made an attempt several times now to legislate on the technology, not on the problem. I just told you a few minutes ago about how quickly the technology moves. By the time legislation gets passed for existing technology, we're already two generations beyond it. It's the wrong approach. And yet, that is the one that they continue to try to take. Don't believe it? Well, remember the internet blackout of a couple months ago? The concern over the Protect IP and SOPA acts? There was an attempt there to regulate the technology, and that's what brought the backlash, rather than looking at the behavior. This is an ongoing problem. Another example is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which prohibits people like myself and some of the faculty here from doing any reverse engineering on software to find out if it has bad things in it or how we might otherwise uh, protect. If a computer virus gets in my system, arguably, it is against the law for me to try to analyze it because of the laws passed by the Congress in an attempt to protect copyrights of the entertainment industry. They legislated against the technology, not the behavior. As a result of this, uh, and also the use of increasing sort of paranoia and worry, um, uh, as an example, you see closed circuit TV cameras popping up everywhere. Experience in England has shown, by the way, that crime rates dip for about six months after a, after a camera goes into place, then goes back to normal. Because the resolution is so poor and there aren't enough people to monitor the cameras, it really doesn't make a difference. And yet, there's this investment in technology rather than in trying to solve the underlying problems. This is the national standard response by government. It really is the wrong approach. And we know that from the beginning of the last century when Automobiles were first introduced. There were attempts made in Illinois to limit their use or limit their speed because the police were afraid that the criminals would be able to get away. <laughs> Wrong approach. Uh, we have
have to adopt the technology and use it rather than prohibit it. Same thing with radios. When two-way radios first came out, they were largely prohibited because we were worried about the criminals using the radios to communicate and to fool the police. Now you can't find a law enforcement officer who doesn't have at least four radios in his or her car and two, uh, maybe two on his or her person. Um, a current example before the Senate, uh, there are two bills uh, for cybersecurity that are being debated and we have people lined up on political partisan uh, lines arguing for them. One side wants greater regulation of utilities and critical infrastructure. The other says that will hurt the economy and we have to have more sharing of communication and encourage them to communicate. And it turns out really they're both wrong uh, because both of those are attempting to deal with the underlying technology. If we don't do something to hold the operators of that infrastructure accountable for making poor decisions over time, they will continue to make poor decisions. If we don't provide uh, funding for education to teach them what the right methods are, they will continue to pick the wrong methods. Simply trying to formulate standards for current technology and enforce them on the infrastructure operators is going to result in them having to adopt practices that were only appropriate for older technology. And so as they improve their technology, they're going to probably open up vulnerabilities because they're going to have to try to respond to these old regulations. Another, another example of where uh, we're sort of making the wrong decisions, uh, the presidential uh, cybersecurity advisor, Howard Schmidt, uh, has really done a marvelous job despite having two bosses. Uh, how, many of you, how many of you have two bosses? Uh, I do, I have a wife and a daughter. Um, <laughs> But one is the national security advisor and one is the national economic advisor, and they don't agree all the time. I think he's done quite well in a position with no authority, no budget, uh, and two bosses who want different things. Uh, you probably do very well in academia, I guess. <laughs> but if you had a problem with cybersecurity, where would you go? Where would you go? DHS, FBI, Secret Service, com uh, somewhere over in NIST, uh, that's another part of the problem. There is no single point of responsibility to respond. That continues to encourage the problem because we don't have coordination at any level, either at the White House or in, in the various federal agencies. Um, there's a lot more that I could, I could point out. Uh, what, I've, what I hope I've done here with these, with these issues is, is to illustrate to you it's not a simple problem. It's not really just a technology problem. But it is a very pervasive, long-lasting, deep problem that people are going to uh, have trouble dealing with because it is expensive and it involves a lot of conflicting interests. But I want to close with a statement, um, is there any hope? And yes, I think there is. Uh, part of that is increasing awareness. We have more people who are aware that there are problems. We are graduating experts. We are graduating people. Uh, you heard a little bit about the initiative here. George Washington University has been at the forefront in this area for a long time, uh, turning out some very, very good graduates uh, to address the problems and to advise people in authority. Uh, there's also uh, a very good chance that at each paradigm shift, we can change things if we're ready. So an example of a paradigm shift is switching to uh, a portable computer like this. It doesn't have a keyboard. It's a very different input. It doesn't have a mouse. There was an opportunity to introduce better security here, but we weren't really up to it. We didn't have enough people trained in how to do it yet. There will be more paradigm shifts coming. If you, if you aren't convinced of that, just think back to what I told you about the technology. We need to be prepared to value security and privacy and resiliency and make sure they're built in and demand them as consumers. We don't need to fix everything at once, and this is the argument I often hear from people in government where I tell them about things that could be done, and they go, oh, we can't afford to do that everywhere. We don't have to do it everywhere. Not every system is as important as every other. Let's take some of the high criticality ones, small group, and fix them and get them right. And once we demonstrate they're right, let's go on to the next one. We don't have to spend it all at once. It can be done in waves, and we do a lot of other things that way as well. But to ignore any of them, simply because it would be too expensive to do all of them, is not an appropriate response either. And last of all, let me say, 
you're a reason to hope. Uh, you're here, you're listening to this. Uh, you haven't thrown anything at me yet, so that's a good sign. <laughs> at least those of you who are awake. And um, if, if you have some concern for this area, if you have some interest, you can contribute to solutions, even if you are not a computing specialist, in what you buy, who you talk to, maybe conversations with your elected representatives, and encouraging programs to change things, like the one here at George Washington University. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you have a good evening. Well, on behalf of us all, that was really a, a truly thought-provoking exercise, right? I think we touched on 50 different things tonight. Um, we're running a little bit late, but I'm going to throw this open to two questions only, and then everybody can come to the reception. Professor Spafford will be there. You can ask him a question, follow up question there if you want to. But who's got a really pressing question? Over there. don't know how to, how to get a lot of these things right perfectly correct the first time. But that's not a reason to leave off the encryption or to do a sloppy job of it. Um, and too much of what is produced now simply has no concern for those issues of security and resiliency. Part of learning how to do it right is by doing it and getting the feedback of learning what works and what doesn't. And right now we haven't done it often enough to really get uh, that feedback. For, for a lot of the general purpose systems. So what, what you asked illustrates several different issues, one of which is what, what actually gets built in and what do we know how to do. And, and both of those are areas that need work. But not having an answer to it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do that. Yeah, go ahead. In your opinion, uh, are the Apple systems safer than Windows systems from hacking? If, if you are targeted by someone who wants your information, it doesn't matter what you run. On the other hand, if you are trying to avoid drive-by attacks, uh, malware that you may pick up by visiting websites and otherwise, you are currently less likely to have those kinds of problems if you're using an up-to-date Apple system. That's not a guarantee for the future. But it has traditionally been the case and is currently the case, we'll have to see where it goes from there. Okay, I'm gonna wind, wind this down. I'm gonna thank Professor Stafford one more time. We're gonna have reception outside, so please join us.